Hello. So this is the second episode of Post-Enlightenment series. And last time I was talking about how people see enlightenment superficially in terms of externals, rather than going deep and seeing the real essence, which is emptiness. Of course, emptiness is hard to see if you're looking for things. <laughs> In emptiness, there's no things. No thing. Nothing. Emptiness is a space of awareness. And once you find it, that opens the door to enlightenment. But people want mystical, magical powers. They want a beautiful body. I was just reading the Shurangama Sutra that Ananda admits that he became a follower of Buddha not out of understanding or philosophy but simply out of attraction to his beauty and qualities. So he was attracted by externals, and because of that, he could not become enlightened as long as Buddha was present. He had to wait. And once Buddha disappeared, then only Ananda could attain. Why? He was hung up on externals. So Ananda is like every immature religionist, every unrealized Buddhist, everybody who is trying to figure out <laughs> what enlightenment is, or actually I think a lot of them have given up on enlightenment. But the Dalai Lama is my favorite uh, kicking dog this week. He one time said that the best meditation is simply a good sleep. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> of course, there are detailed instructions for meditation in Buddha's teaching. Actually, he doesn't call it meditation. He calls it concentration. Jhana, the Pali word, has a slightly different meaning from Sanskrit dhyana, from which it's derived. It actually means a specific type of concentration, particular object of meditation. Buddha calls it a base. A base is like a context. Context determines meaning. So the meaning of what you experience is always always going to be in terms of the context, the space in which it shows up. You can't get away from it. In pure emptiness, there is no meaning. There can be no meaning because emptiness is not a thing. To have name and form, to have significance, you have to have being. And being is in the space of becoming. So becoming is the meaning of being. There is no such thing as static being. It's always changing, always becoming, always evolving into something new. So when somebody like the Dalai Lama, who, who loves to sleep, he's already admitted that his best meditation is sleep. They look at enlightenment as something dangerous. Well, why? Because enlightenment is awakening. If you're awakening, then you're not sleeping. And you're not meditating either. Meditation is finished. So post-enlightenment also means post-meditation. Meditation 
Well, let's start with concentration, okay? Concentration is not an opening. It's not an awakening. It's a narrowing of consciousness. It's a dream, a very specific dream. There are eight jhanas in classical Theravada Buddhism going from concentration on a discursive train of thought all the way up to neither awareness nor non-awareness, neither perception nor non-perception. And these are a narrowing of context. In actual meditation, the context opens up to infinity, to emptiness. And in enlightenment, it becomes like that permanently. That's why the Buddha says, now and in the past, I have only presented teachings in relation to emptiness. In other words, that's what this is all about. It's about emptiness. It's about no thingness. It's not about even meditation. <laughs> Real enlightenment is beyond meditation. It's post-meditation. When the meditation is finished. Now, meditation is not something you can do. Meditation, when it happens... It's a natural phenomenon. It's a natural state of mind that we deny ourselves when we create an ego. Why is that? An ego is a narrowing. An ego is a wall. It walls off I from thou. Isn't it? This is me, that's you. And there's a very sharp line. And in fact, the law is said to be nine-tenths about possession. What is possession? It's simply the acquisition of something by the ego. And this process of acquisition is known as the root sequence. The root sequence, a certain sequence of thoughts in which we artificially make something mine. Of course, nothing is mine. There's, there's no I to own anything. So how could something be mine? So it's an assertion. It's a, it's a conceit. It's a synthetic thing. It's an imposition on reality. Huh? Like Google Glasses. <laughs> What's the new Microsoft thing coming out? Paints a picture on top of whatever you see. So we're wearing these ego glasses and we're seeing the whole world in terms of ego, I and mine. But both of those are simply thoughts. They're not real, they're not dhammas. I mean, the thought itself is a dhamma, but the content of that thought is unreal. Actually, the content of all thoughts is unreal. All concepts are simply narrowing of consciousness. Narrowing of context until we can make something ours. That's all. So when the Dalai Lama says nobody in the West, no Westerners are allowed to teach or learn Tantra because that would require breaking some of the five lay precepts, one of which is no inappropriate sexual relations. Now, what does inappropriate mean, though? See, that's the thing. Well, the Dalai Lama defines it in a book that he wrote later on to explain this outrageous pronouncement of his. He says, basically, any kind of sexual activity not designed to produce children, but simply for enjoyment, is basically unacceptable. Well, this is the same line that kings and conquerors and despots and tyrants and dictators have been giving us since time immemorial, isn't it? Make lots of kids so we can go out and win the war against the bad guys. In fact, that's the whole program 
of all these leaders, I should call them misleaders, because they mislead the public into war and destruction, into activities actually against their own interest. So the Dalai Lama has firmly put himself in that class of misleaders. He is responsible for a lot of uh, religious violence in Tibet. I mean, people kill themselves over devotion to the Dalai Lama. They burn themselves in the street. So this man now wants to dictate religious policy. Uh, which methods can and cannot be used for self-realization in a Buddhist context. But wait a minute, Tantra is Buddhist. In fact, the Dalai Lama's own lineage, the Galupas, are Tantrics. So what he's really saying is, we Tibetans have a monopoly on Tantra, and nobody else can teach it or practice it. And if they do, what is that? Students are encouraged to publicize such unethical activities, quote-unquote, from the 1993 letter that the Dalai Lama dictated but then refused to sign. Tricky dude. Politicians usually are. You can't expect straightforward behavior from someone like that. Why? Because he's using you. He's exploiting you. He's saying, bring more children into an already overcrowded world and strain the resources further so that we have war and then we can use up all those unnecessary bodies that we created. Isn't it? For the glory of Buddhism or whatever. It doesn't fly. Buddha was nonviolent. He never authorized violence in the name of his teaching. Of course, people did it and do it still today. So the Dalai Lama has this army of fanatical tantrikas. And once somebody gets on their blacklist, they are free to use any means whatsoever to silence him. And that's what they've been doing to me. Until I found this out, which was only a couple of days ago. I thought that, okay, maybe there's a couple of uh, fanatical religious moralists made it their hobby to uh, spread black propaganda about me. I thought, yeah, maybe it's just a couple of individuals. Crazy. I know one of them. He's the son of two psychiatrists in North Carolina. I feel sorry. I mean, I really pity the guy. He's useless. He came to visit us once for a month and didn't do any seva. Didn't do anything around the temple at all. Yeah, he gave a little donation, but so what? We were all paying for our accommodations there at the time with our personal money. But he didn't give anything except money. He didn't give any service. So then later on, when it came out that I'm a tantrika, well, I've always been a tantrika. I was born a tantrika. My mother was a tantrika crying out loud. If there's anybody who would have a license to practice and teach Tantra, it would be me. But no, according to the Dalai Lama, anybody who does that has to be publicized, outed. Huh? So okay, I was outed by the Dalai Lama's boys. And now all my Buddhist friends have withdrawn from me. None of them will talk to me. None of them will return my messages or, or pick up my calls. Thanks, Dalai Lama. You got rid of a bunch of jerks. Thanks. So now what? Well, Buddhism, quote unquote, is failing. Catholicism is failing. Christianity, Judaism, and even Islam, they're all failing. They're resorting to more and more extreme actions and policies to justify their existence in the face of mounting evidence that they're not only irrelevant, but actually harmful. Look at what the Dalai Lama has done. Huh? 
They basically forced me out of the monkhood, forced me out of Sri Lanka huh? by withdrawing all support. See, the Buddhists, they don't kill you. They simply go silent. They give you the silent treatment. You know, like when you've had an argument with your boyfriend or girlfriend, and then you're stalked around the house, all glum and silent for days. Huh? <laughs> that's what people do when they can't resolve issues. And that's what the Buddhists do, because they refuse to discuss anything. They'll only discuss on the premise that these principles, these precepts, are the basis of enlightenment. And they're not. They can't be, because they're cultural. Even the commentators on the Buddhist shastras, scriptures, sutras, admit that the definition of what is acceptable or what is illicit sexual activity is cultural, and it can differ from time and place. So, <laughs> Dalai Lama has his idea, but every different culture has its own idea. What's moral in um, Greenwich Village in New York is immoral in Saudi Arabia. Well, so what? In the context of emptiness, it's all nonsense. It's all false. So are we going to say, well, this is more false than that? <laughs> no, false is false. Relative truth is relative truth. The only absolute truth is emptiness, because that's the only thing that can never change. Everything that has being is always becoming. Everything that exists is constantly changing. That's the three characteristics, huh? Anicca, dukkha, anatta. Everything is impermanent, everything is unsatisfactory, and everything is not self. Whatever is, whatever has being, has these three characteristics. You can't take it away from them. So, including Buddhism, is also impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. So what are these people getting all excited and upset about? You know? Really what we're doing, when we say, there is no hard and fast rule, there is no fixed religious principle except emptiness. Because that's the absolute. Huh? What are they trying to do? They're trying to create something that's real. They were trying to say Buddhism is real and this other stuff is false. But wait a minute, what about the people who attained enlightenment through that other stuff that you don't like? Huh? There are 84,000 Dharma doors. So do you know all 84,000? Can you list them? Is there a book somewhere? No. Nobody can know. There's only one who has known enlightenment can even see these doors. The Bhairav Vigyan Tantra lists 110 or 112 methods of meditation. That's the biggest one I know, biggest list I know. Only 110. And there's 84,000? Come on. It would take a lifetime to explore even the 110 in Bhairav Vigyan Tantra. What to speak of thousands and thousands that we don't know. So there's no restriction. There can be no restriction on the methods of attaining enlightenment. If you read the archives of the people who attained, especially in Zen, some of them <laughs> attained enlightenment. One guy attained enlightenment after being thrown out of a second story window. <laughs> Another guy attained enlightenment by being hit so hard that, by, by his master that he died. But he attained. 
So you never know. You can never know what is going to be the thing that sparks your enlightenment. With me, it was a crying baby in the, next to me in the airplane. It made me concentrate with extra effort. And because of that, in that moment, I attained. Fourth path. So, what are these 84,000 doors? Nobody knows. So, can you equivocally, unequivocally say that uh, a certain type of sexual activity is not going to lead to enlightenment? No. You can't say that. So, the Dalai Lama, by falling into line with all the tyrants and despots, and I'm sure, you know, he's been advised by the CIA and State Department, and, and they have worked to regulate religion, especially in the United States, for decades. So, anything this guy says is subject to to political analysis as well as a philosophical analysis. And in both counts, he's clearly off base. Huh? He himself is a tantrika. He practices and teaches tantra. But who is he to deny it to anybody else? Back in 2011. Now, I used to teach tantra in California. Nobody seems to be too upset about that. But... When I was in India, I taught Tantra to two of my disciples who asked for it. They asked me to te teach them Tantra, and I did it. So, now for that, I'm getting all this grief, even five years later? I'm not teaching anybody right now. Nobody is qualified. Those became qualified because they had been celibate for three years under my direction. And I knew they were good men, a good character. So I taught them. At least I demonstrated the techniques for them to be perfectly accurate. That doesn't mean I had sex with them. That doesn't mean any laws were broken. That doesn't mean anything. I just showed them some things. And we took some photos. And then somebody stole those photos. And tried to use them to extort money from me, and when that failed, put them online. Well, he was going to put them online anyway. So, this is the type of person that the, the Dalai Lama's followers are believing. And me, who was a Buddhist monk for five years, and a, a Vaishnava Vedic monk for 30 years before that, and a guru, and have helped many people attain stages of enlightenment. No, I can't be believed. Uh, we have to believe some blackmailer, some extortionist. Uh, why? Because it matches your story. Uh, you like that. You like that story. Huh? Here's this big bad tantrika. Oh, better stop him from teaching. <laughs> so the point is, if we're talking about enlightenment, First of all, the only person who can know enlightenment is someone who's been through it. The Dalai Lama is talking like an ordinary, unenlightened religious, religious person, a religionist, a dogmatist, a moralist, a fraud, an exploiter, a tyrant, a thief. He's, taking, he's taken away from me my livelihood. And I could sue him, especially under U.S. law. I could bring him into court and bring out all this evidence and do discovery and do investigation. And of course, these people are cowards who are following him. Well, anyone who follows anybody is a coward. <laughs> you, you have to understand the character of these people. As soon as one of them is put on the spot, and offered a plea deal, he's going to out all the other ones. But that's what they do. They're cowards. So, we'll see what happens. Uh, 
Of course, the, the next time I create a public event, it's going to be uh, very closely watched, let's say, by the Buddhist community and then especially the non-Tibetan Buddhist community or the non-American or Western Buddhist community, those who are not a party to this 1993 agreement, marginalizing Tantra and Tantricas. They are going to be watching this very closely as a test case. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. So this is what happens post-enlightenment, you see? As soon as you say, I'm enlightened, I got it. I got the path realizations. Ask me anything about it, I can tell you. But they have never approached me for my side of the story. So that means I'm going to tell it in front of a judge. That means I'm going to hire the best legal counsel I can to help me tell my story in a way that makes a difference for as many people as possible who are currently under oppression, religious morality, and persecution. So this is what it means, post-enlightenment. Huh? Post-enlightenment, you have to become an activist. You have to do something. You have to make a change. You have to make a difference in the world. You have to. And it has to be such that it promotes authentic enlightenment, not the stupid religious following, not the stupid philosophical speculation that has ruined everybody's understanding of the sutras. But the actual uh, authentic understanding of enlightenment by an enlightened person is the only way to understand it. You can't otherwise. Look, what gave me the key to third and fourth path was that I went to an enlightened master, Bhikkhu Nyanananda, and he said to me three words, Nibbana is non-conceptual. That was it. Boom, I went into a trance. I suddenly realized a whole bunch of things. <laughs> I could do a whole video just on that one moment and then by working on that by meditating over it digesting it chewing on it within a year I had realized third and fourth paths now people go lifetimes without realizing these things why because they're getting caught up in the bullshit you should be able to realize paths at least first path, within three to five years, or less even. Uh, if you have adequate guidance, meaning living with a master, you could realize it in a hundred days or less. But you have to be qualified, you have to be prepared, you have to be a real disciple, not a bullshit religious follower. Not just a theoretical person, but a practical person, actually doing the practice. So, I'm going to wind this up now. The main point is that enlightenment is not a static thing. It's not like you attain enlightenment and then you're just silent, you know, oh. <laughs> That's a very inferior stage of enlightenment. To be enlightened is one thing. To be a master is another thing, and it takes a whole new path of development, which obviously uh, cannot be taught to you by anyone. Just like thinking for yourself. <laughs> thinking for yourself cannot be taught. If someone thinks you th <laughs> teaches you to think for yourself, you're not thinking for yourself, are you? So you have to learn it all by yourself. Becoming a master is similar. No one can help you. People can help you become enlightened. And people can help you to be a master by becoming disciples. I mean, what's the meaning of a master without a disciple? 
It's like the cowboy without a horse. <laughs> so, or without cows. <laughs> when uh, a person becomes enlightened, they have so much bliss. I mean, I have access to so much bliss whenever I want. So much light. Uh, it's sometimes very hard to get to sleep at night. There's so much light. Um, it changes things, you know. It's just like everybody is used to scraping by on a little money, somehow making do with less and so on. Well, what happens if one day you win the lottery? Suddenly money isn't an issue anymore. It changes things. It changes everything. Now every other move is, isn't about money anymore. Now it's more about, well, what do I really want to do? So the same thing. Everyone is scraping along on little, little happiness, very mm, dry, stale happiness, secondhand enjoyment derived from material things or from the mind, which is a material thing. So when you suddenly find the key to bliss in the third jhana, it's like it changes everything. It's just like mm, rich people aren't always talking about money. Well, unless they're stupid rich people, obsessive rich people, really rich people. Money is the last thing they think about, the last thing they talk about. Why? It's not an issue. It's not an issue, unless you want to buy a whole country or something, which is going on. Money is just like water to a rich person, really rich person. So, to a really enlightened person, bliss is like that. Bliss is cheap. It's abundant. It's free. Just concentrate your mind in a certain way, and boom, wow. So that changes your whole orientation. All of a sudden, bliss is not so rare and expensive and valuable as it used to be. It's just like sand here at the beach. So what I'm trying to say here is that it really doesn't matter to me if I am successful as a teacher in the world. I have everything. Huh? I'm the Bill Gates of, of enlightenment. <laughs> I have unlimited fortune for all practical purposes. Unlimited knowledge, unlimited beauty, unlimited bliss. Yeah. Okay. So am I going to just sit in my room and bliss out and all of that? No. No. Because now I have something that is in great demand all over the world. It's the key to happiness. And, and that's only the beginning. That's only the third jhana. My God. Five more to go. And each one is better and better than the last. So what are you missing? Huh? By chasing happiness. Neophyte Buddhists are chasing happiness because they're unhappy. Now, as soon as you get to the point where you're happy, then you can think about something else. So we see the majority of Buddhists engaged in economic and... Uh, spiritual, emotional welfare activities, huh? But actually, that's only the preliminary stage. It's not even the beginning of the path yet. Beginning of the path is right view. And right view, I mean, that takes some work to acquire. So a person has to be in a good material situation. They have to be prosperous, free from disease and, and suffering in the ordinary sense. Then they can start looking into the real problems of life. And that's what we're going to talk about in the later episodes of this series. Thank you very much.